fallen, the remembered, the honored, fathers and mothers, sons and daughters, sisters and brothers, soldiers, heroes. Today we remember the profound sacrifices that have been made on our behalf. We remember the courageous men and women who have given their lives in service to our nation. Their legacy lives on in the hearts and minds of those they left behind. And their sacrifice will never and can never be forgotten. We honor their memory not only with words of gratitude, but also with a solemn commitment to uphold the values for which they so bravely fought and died. We ask God to grant us peace as we mourn those who gave everything for our freedom. May we always hold their memory dear and never forget the price they paid. So let us honor the fallen today as we remember our fathers and our mothers, our sons and our daughters, our sisters and our brothers, our heroes. Welcome each one this morning that's come to join with us here in the church for the Memorial Day weekend. We appreciate your presence and may the Lord bless us and give you a wonderful Memorial Day and a Memorial Day week. Let's begin our service by turning to hymn number 714 and for those that can and will, we'll sing all four stanzas of the battle hymn of the Republic. <clears throat> Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Our God is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have built in him an altar in the evening dews and damps. I can read his righteous sentence by his dim and flaring lamp. Our days marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Marching on, he has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory. Marching on in the 
beauty of the lilies. Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free while God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Our God is marching on. Let's remain standing. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you. We thank you that we are able to live in a country where we can come and we can worship you freely, Lord. And we thank you for the men and women who fought and served for this country to give us that freedom to be able to do so, Lord. God, we come to you now and we ask that you be uplifted in every word and every deed and every action that is done here today brings nothing but glory and honor to you in jesus name we pray amen amen, amen. you may be seated if you'd like to join with the choirs we sing together hymn number 30 if you'll turn there in your hymnals as we sing all hail the power of Jesus' name, all four stand.
Anyway, we'll ask the ushers now if they will to come at this time as we receive the Lord's tithes and our offerings. Our Father, we come before your presence this morning to thank you for all that you've done for us, to thank you for our country and for all those that gave their lives that we might have the freedom to worship you. Father, now as we receive the offering, we pray that your blessings will be upon it, that it will be used, Lord, in the kingdom to win many souls to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we are going to uh, have my wife, Wanda Bryant. She is going to sing the special today. She may be a little bit nervous, y'all, so uh, give her an applause or something. To make her sure. When I first started walking with the Lord, I did not fully trust Him. How He longed for me to understand that I could. So through the valley, he led me afraid as I could be until I felt his loving arms embracing me. Oh! 
How could I ever doubt a God whose hands hold the universe? Why would I ever question his ability? There's no place that I can go that he doesn't know exactly where I'll be. He's always aware of wherever I am and just what I need. And He's come through too many times That puts my mind at ease Oh, and I'll stake my very life He's gonna take care of me After all these years, he's been so faithful, and he's proven to be true. Oh, never more will I doubt or question why, because I've seen him work before, and I know what God can do. He's come through too many times That puts my mind at ease Oh, and I'll stake my very life He's gonna take care of me Take care of me. Man, I may be partial, but that was that was some good singing right there. I mean, goodness. Well, for some of y'all, y'all might be wondering why we have this table over here with this candle lit. Well, what it is is it's a Memorial Day remembrance table. See, the white tablecloth represents the purity and selflessness that service members possess. The black napkin represents the sorrow of captivity or death. The red rose and ribbon represent the loved ones that are left behind. The white candle 
represents sought after peace. The lemon represents the missing services, service members bitter fate. The salt represents loved ones tears over their missing service member. The glass inverted represents their inability to share our meal. And the empty chair represents a void that is in our heart. May we remember that freedom is never free. Man. You want me to go into my message or? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Now we're going to uh, open our Bibles up to the book of Psalms. And we're going to be in Psalms 8. Psalms 8. Or, I'm, I'm sorry, Psalm 8. Psalm 8. That is one of the big things that people, they put an S on the end of like Psalms and Revelations, but it's Psalm. It's the book of Psalms, but okay, I digress. I digress. I'm rambling now. Today, we're going to embark on a journey into the profound wisdom of Psalm 8, a scripture that so eloquently encapsulates humanity's importance in the vastness of this great universe. I want us to delve into these words together, and hopefully by now you have found Psalm 8. And the word of God says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man? And that is what I have titled the message, what is man? That thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and has crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the path of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we are so thankful we get to open your word and hear from you today. I do not want to be this a message that they are hearing from me, but a message they are hearing through me by you, Lord. God, we come to you today and we we appreciate the great sacrifice that you made for us on Calvary, Lord. That is a memorial day that will go down in history. Lord God, we lift you up right now and give you the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. See, in September of 1977, NASA launched Voyager 1 a mission to design the study of the outer solar system and beyond. And on February 14, 1990, after completing its primary mission and preparing to leave the solar system, NASA engineers turned its cameras around. They took a final picture of the Earth from almost four billion miles away before it left the solar system for good. The picture, it is called a pale blue dot. 
because that is all the earth looked like from that distance. The astronomer and writer Carl Sagan, in a speech he gave at Cornell University in 1994, described the lesson he took from the picture and he said, quote, if you look at it, you see a dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives here on this dot. The aggregate of all our joys and sufferings, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every hopeful child, every mother and father, every inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived here on this little mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a tiny stage in a vast cosmic arena. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, and the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by the point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. See, when Carl Sagan contemplated his size concerning the universe, he felt a sense, a sense of smallness. And in the grand scheme of things, his observation would be accurate. We are indeed small. However, his observation was only partially correct. There is more profound truth to be uncovered. Sagan's realization of our insignificance was driven by our tendency to overestimate ourselves and our own capabilities. This is a call to embrace humility, quality that can guide us to perceive our position in the universe, but more accurately. Indeed, we are less significant than we think we are. But that does not mean that our lives, they're meaningless. We should ask ourselves, how can we matter in such a great and vast universe? And that's where we are here in Psalm 8. As the author, David, the psalmist, who wrote these words. I just imagine him one night sitting there looking up at the skies and just, just thinking, man, the creator of this universe, he hung these stars. He hung the moon and just really thinking of his own insignificance at this point. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, we see a powerful reflection of our place in the universe. And it attacks this question head on. It humbles us by making us consider our insignificance in the grand scheme. It then shows us our significance. It's not found in who we are on our own, but who we are because of God and the creator of this vast universe and what he has done. But first we want to look at, we gotta look who God is. Verses 1 and 2. Let's go back. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. 
who has set the glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. See, we must first see God for who he truly is before we can even think about us. See, he is majestic. The glory of the Lord is so grand that humanity cannot even put it into words. As one of the uh, commentaries that I read, is that's what he is talking about here when he's saying, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies. He is saying here, when we sit there and start to think about the greatness and the majesty of our Lord and here and how he created this earth and when we think when we think we're looking at him and we see him for the first time when our faith is made sight it is go we're going to be like babies and like sucklings like you know when you first trying to learn how to talk blah 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 blah, blah. Just gibberish. That is what we're going to be unsurmounted to. We're going to be belittled down to. We're going to be like babes when we look at it and we look at the greatness and the majesty of our king. That's who we have. And see, we're like a baby trying to come up with the words of his majesty. Then we have in verses 3 and 4, now we see who man is. It says, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? See, the psalmist here then moves from considering God to considering himself. When he looks at how big and powerful this world is, he realizes how big and the heavens are a work of his finger. God created this with his finger and he spoke it into existence. And how small man is against such grandeur. Man shrinks to his insignificance. Man alone in this universe is nothing when considered against the backdrop of this vast universe. It's impossible to think that anything we do even matters. The psalmist summarizes in two verses the exact sentiment of Carl Sagan. But fortunately, that's not where the psalm stops. Now we see who man is because of God. Look at verses 5 through 6. It says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. See, I'm so glad that the psalm did not stop at verse 4. Um, verse 5 begins with words of contrast. For thou. A man by himself is as an insignificant animal on an insignificant planet orbiting an insignificant star on the outer edge of an insignificant galaxy. Nobody knows we are here. Nobody cares. But the Bible says, for thou. Our significance is not in who we are by ourselves, but in who God has made us. He has given us dominion. He's made us in his image, as it says in Genesis 1. Um, um, yes, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We are made in his image. He made us a little lower than the angels. And he crowned us with glory and honor. Because if you look in the creation story, he spoke everything into existence. 
But when he created man, he knelt down and he grabbed a piece of clay and he breathed. God breathed into his nostrils and gave him a soul. And I know some of you are not going to like me here. That's what makes us different than the rest of creation. We have a soul. We are created in his image. Not by looks, but by being able to work. By being able to discern between good and evil. We are made in his image. The, the Holy Spirit gives us that discernment. Our soul gives us purpose. And Christ here then goes, who man is because of God. Then we have, in verses 5 through 8, it says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. See, I am so glad the psalm doesn't end in verse 4. It begins with a word of conscience. Yet you, man, by himself is an insignificant animal and an insignificant planet. Or, oh, I've already read that. And Sorry. But they show us the significance God bestows on us. God gives us value. You made him a little lower than God. See, according to a recent study, the chemicals in the human body are worth about $3.00 and 50 cent. A human is not worth very much, but that is not all a man is. We, of all animals, are more than animals. God created in us his image. Because of this, a human life has value. He made us just a little lower than him. Other animals look down at the earth and their food and feel content. We look at the heavens, to the heavens, and see God the reason is because he made us to choose him. And then God gives us honor. You crowned him with glory and majesty. We look at this universe and we see the glory and we see the majesty of God. The psalmist says that God has crowned us with the same majesty. When we consider the universe, we know the greatness of God. If we were to look at, ma at man this way, we would be equally amazed at what man can do and how radically different God made him. Not that man is perfect or even good most of the time, but he's startlingly different and amazing. God gives us work. You make him rule, ruler over the works of your hand. God made us in his image. He made us unique. He also made us valuable. It's important to realize that we were made for a meaningful labor. Genesis said God created man and put him in an evidently unfinished garden. Even before the fall, there was work to do. This is a part of the image of God and the glory of God on us. He invites us to collaborate with him. Then God, he gave us a responsibility. You have put all things under his feet. God did not just give us work to do. He gave us a responsibility. We're in charge of this planet. We can do excellent for good, or we can do it for evil. That is the basic story of human history. People use this power for both purposes. But since our power comes from God, we need to see ourselves as working for him. We do not just have power and authority over the world. We have a responsibility for it. We have to learn to exercise our authority as an act of stewardship. Just like we do with our money, we do with our possessions. 
we must do with this world. And in our application here, I want you to see yourself as God does. You're neither the center of everything nor the pointless afterthought of a blind universe. God didn't just create things and leave us to be. No. We have a creator who we can talk to, who wants to hear from us. He didn't just leave us here at our own being. You have glory, honor, significance, and a role to play in this world. But you are not the source of any of it. Two verses from the New Testament help us manage a proper balance between these two extremes. The answer um, to arrogance is a gratitude to God. To the self-centered side of all of us, Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 4, For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? You got everything you have from somewhere else. Even everything you earn by your skill, your hard work, your intelligence. You did not do anything to get the brain, the brawn, or the opportunities you have had in life. They were instilled in you by a creator. You may have been a good steward of what you've been given, but you were given a lot to start with. Therefore, see yourself as a steward entrusted by God with everything you have, including your body, because the body is the temple of the Lord. Glorify God with everything he has given you. Use it all well, but above all, be grateful to God for it. Then the answer is to isolation is the love of God. To the side of us that often feels alone, nobody hears us, that we're just simply existing in a sea of billions of people. Jesus himself says in Matthew 10, 29 through 31, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? Or yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head, God knows the number of them. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. God is not some disengaged and detached leader. He created this vast universe and is acquainted with every detail of it. So we can draw comfort from the fact that even when we feel most alone, God sees, knows, and he cares. And we are not forgotten. And really quickly, I would like for you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And I'll be very, rather quick, yes, rather quick with this. But I couldn't help. I, I debated on if I was going to mention this, but yes, I am. It says in Hebrews 2, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection that world to come whereof we speak? But one in a certain place testifies, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, then crowned him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. 
that has put all things in subjection under his feet. For in all, in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, and he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things bringing in many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And go on down to verse 17. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, or the word help, them that are tempted. See, you serve, if you are a Christian, what the Hebrews is telling us here, the author of Hebrews, whether it be Paul or whoever, is what is saying here is, yes, we were created, like the psalmist David said, we were created and, and we were made lower than the angels. But we couldn't pay our sin debt. We couldn't do it. So, as it says here in um, verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, and he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. God, he tasted death for you. He could have easily just thrown up and thrown this world away, but he didn't. He was like, no, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my son to live the perfect, sinless life. And he's going to die on the cross. He is going to be crowned with glory and honor through mocking, through a crown of thorns, through suffering. And while he's on it, he knows what you're going through. He knows these temptations that you're... He has tasted flesh. He was robed in it. So do not think that you serve a God that does not know what you're going through. You are... You have a significance. You have a purpose. Just like he told Esther. And through the word, he said... You were created for a time such as this. I know this world, it can look bleak. And it can just look like everything is going crazy. But I'm here to tell you, the world has always looked crazy. It has always looked that way. It has always been an enemy of grace. They just hit it a lot better. The thing is, guys, we got to quit whining and be like, oh my gosh, this is going on. Oh man, man. Guess what? No. We have a Savior who died for us, and we have the hope that this world needs. And it is time we started living like it instead of walking around like, oh, woe's me, woe's me. And guess what? I'm not making light of your problems. I'm not. I'm not. But the thing is, we have what the psalmist didn't. We have the completed word of God. And we have a Savior who we know came and he died. We know what he did for us. So what I'm just trying to say is let's start living like this isn't our home. Amen. That, yes, 
heaven is going to be great. But the thing is, this. I'm going to walk around like the Lord has saved me. And I'm going to tell you, I had to preach this to me way before I preached it to you. Because you can ask my wife. I can sit there and get in the world with me, pull a, pull a pitiful me. Oh, man, this world's doing this. But when I read Hebrews 2, it hit me. John, you think, you think I don't know what you're going through? You think I didn't know that you were going to live at this time for this purpose? Where we're going to have a, the next month, we're going to have a whole bunch celebrating, spitting in God's face and calling sin pride. Or where we're going to live in a day where then we don't know if you're a man or a woman or not. Or if marriage is between just a man or a woman, or a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. And now they're, they're saying that you can be polyamorous now, where you don't have to just be two people, you can be three. That's where we gone. But the thing is, I've read the end of the book. I know how it's going to end. And let's start living like it. Jesus died for you. And if he died for you, tell somebody about him. Tell them what he did for you. And pray that they come to know him. Because guess what? Just as he came and he died, he's coming back again. And that time, he ain't coming as a baby in a manger. He is coming as judge. And I'm sorry. I want to hear, well done and good and faithful servant. Not those sad words of, depart from me. I never knew you. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the love and the grace and the mercy that you bestow upon us. Have us to speak of you as not in our own significance in who we are, but in what you have called us to do. We thank you for your majesty, Lord. And we give you the praise, honor, and glory for it all. And I'm going to turn it over to Brother Jack. If you have somebody you want to pray for, or maybe this has been you. Maybe you've been walking around thinking, woe is me. And you need to come to this altar if you're able and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I haven't been, I haven't been living for you. I haven't I, I, I've been just focusing on my problems and not you. The altar is open. Let's stand together and turn to hymn number 260. So we sing verse number one, His way with thee. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burdens, carry all your load? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you can cleanse your heart and make you free his love can fill your soul and you will see twas best for him to have his way with thee amen for our dismissal let's open our hymnals now to number 453 as we sing together, I just 
Keep trusting my Lord. Amen. Amen. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and he gives a song. Though the storm clouds darken the trail, oh, the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord, he will never fail. He's a faithful friend, such a faithful friend, I can count. Storm clouds darken the sky, oh, the heavenly trail. I just keep trusting my Lord, he will never fail. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you. It's been wonderful to have you in the house of the Lord today. Enjoy the rest of the uh, Memorial Day weekend. And also, uh, John's going to be with us on Wednesday night, so don't forget that. Six o'clock, six o'clock Wednesday night, our preacher will be with us. So be, make your arrangements to come. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the week.